Hello, everybody. How y'all doing? You made it without Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Do you know anything that's going on in the world? I bet you do. I bet you do. Let's stand up together this evening as we get ready to start this service tonight. Praise God. Maybe you can look at somebody and tell them hello. Wave at them. Hope you're doing all right. We'll have a slim crowd tonight, looks like. Boy, isn't this lovely weather? Lovely weather. We get our ushers to come, and some of you may have an offering you'd like to give. If you do, we're certainly wanting to give you that opportunity to do that. If you're watching us tonight on the internet, uh, there's a handout for you for tonight's lesson. It's the last lesson of this series that we've been teaching. And we've missed several weeks here because of outside guests and missed some Wednesdays. POBC slash handout, I believe, will take you right to the spot. This is lesson 10. So if you're at home and you want to you print out a handout or two, if there's two of you, you can do that right now. We're going to pray before we take the offering, and we're going to ask God to meet with us tonight. Father, we thank you for bringing us together again. We're excited, anticipating what you're going to do in 2021. I want you to bless these people. They've supported our church. They've given of their tithe and offering, and you've blessed them, I know. Continue to bless them. Father, minister to those who need healing in our church. I pray you'd minister to them powerfully and mightily. Father, let us be prophetic in our preaching and teaching. We seek that gift of prophecy. We seek the gifts of healing. We want the gift of faith. We want the working of miracles. We need your help, God. As we enter into this new year, we're coming hard after you. We're going to pursue these spiritual gifts. As Paul said, desire spiritual gifts. We're coming after them because we need them in the body of Christ. We need them in the body of Christ. Praise God. And everybody said amen. amen. God, God bless you all. You may be seated. Thank you for being here tonight. If you have, if you have the book on prayer, then you should be reading it. I hope you are able to follow along in what we were talking about. The 21 days of devotion does not start on the first page. You found that out, right? You got to slip on over to into the book and find that uh, first devotion, and we've read. Two, tomorrow uh, was one of my favorite daily devotions. Tomorrow was a wonderful devotion. You're going to love it. If you're reading the book, and I hope you are, we've ordered 100, and some people got antsy and went ahead and got on Amazon and ordered them one, and that's okay. That's okay. But uh, we do have some announcements. Everybody get your phone out right quick, okay? But that little... Uh, Slide up there for us, Sister April. Just today, we've started operating a new service. And let me explain to you what this is. We, we're changing our schedule Sunday. Y'all know that. So everybody get your phone out. I'm going to tell you, we're not going to blow your phone up. But we're going to streamline very, we're going to really streamline our announcements on Sunday morning. Because we're starting our worship at 11. And we're going to take rid of all the, get rid of all the fluff in the service. And sometimes those announcements go on and on. We've already tried to have a policy that we only make announcements in here that apply to the entire church. And we don't always do that, but we try to keep that general rule. If it don't, if it don't apply to everybody, then we're going to let the groups do their announcement. But text POBC to this number. All right? You can do it right now. You have my permission. Now, here's what I'm promising you. We're not going to blow your phone up. We're not going to send you prayer requests. These will be strategic announcements for the whole church. 
Now, as you get into this, and you're in particular groups, maybe you have kids in rock, then uh, we're going to be sharing with you the way that you can join those particular groups. So you will, you will get text if something's going on in that group. And this is going to be beneficial to us. But don't forget Sunday. Everybody ready for Sunday? What time do we start serving coffee? <laughs> the coffee drinkers, Brother Josh, they were speaking out, 9.30. So 9.30 and at 10 o'clock, what do we have at 10, Brother Ron? First word. First word. We're starting a series we did ages ago called Heart Attack. And it was my favorite series we ever did here. We just wanted to kick it off with something. We're going to have some neat things coming up. It will not be a real long class. And at 9.45, they'll be dismissing the kids. So for adults in here, we're going to be dismissing you in time to go and get your kids out of Sunday school and bring them in here for the 11 o'clock worship service. Is everybody ready? And I've had a lot of people text me and tell me in person on the phone. They think we're going to love this new schedule. And I personally think we're going to love it. So we'll just uh, make one more announcement about this and move on. Nurseries one, two, and three. That's the nursery classes over here. And none of you are going to be affected unless your grandkids over here. But these, these, the younger ones will not be coming into the sanctuary. They will be staying in their classes. So our teachers are going to have a chance to be in the morning worship service. And any of you, and a lot of you have taught in the past, and you know how you miss being in that morning worship service. In fact, we had teachers who took a leave of absence or discontinued because they wanted, they felt like they weren't, uh, they needed to be in that service. So, all righty. Everybody ready? Praise God. Let's go to our handout tonight. Let me give you some exciting news. Six brand new first-time guests last night at seven. <laughs> Are you praying for seven? Had some prodigals there. Amen. God's going to do some great things through seven. And this is the last lesson. They're not teaching these exact lessons, but they're very similar. Tonight, we're talking about the sharing choice. I have two verses I want to read to you from the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, actually, it's the same verse. Uh, oh, wait a minute. For those of you online, I just got a text. What is the number that I need to text to? All right, if you're watching online, get your pen out. Can you put that on the screen? I don't know if they can get that on the screen or not. Can you do that, April? It's oh, that's Dacry up there. I'm sorry. Here's the number, 318-217-8831. 318-217-8831. Just text P-O-B-C and you'll get a response. If you've already texted, you've already got a response. And again, let me tell you, uh, we're going to give you some, some key words in the future so you can receive text on specific, specific things. So there you have it, 318-217-8831. Let's look at Matthew 5 and 10. I'm going to read this first in the English version. Happy are those who are persecuted because they do what God requires. Here's the way this verse read or reads in the New King James Version. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Sunday morning I talked and preached about the spirit of fear. Remember that? He had not given us a spirit of fear, power, love, and sound mind. I want to clarify something about this fear. If you read this verse in context, this is what the Apostle Paul is saying to Timothy. Don't be afraid 
to share the gospel. That's the context of that verse. He's not talking about being afraid of the devil or afraid of a person. And, and there was persecution. It's mentioned in this passage. But he's saying to, he's saying to Timothy, and that's what we're going to be talking about tonight, the sharing choice. It's not about being afraid of a virus or being afraid of a sickness or a disease. No, it's a fear of sharing the gospel. Telling somebody your testimony. Number one. I must yield myself to God to be used to bring this good news to others both by my example and by my words. And both of those are very important. Don't you agree? By my example and by my words. A part of my recovery from hurts and habits and hang-ups Involves helping other people who have hurts, habits, and hang-ups. By that I mean we can start telling somebody else, this is what God did for me. This is where I was. We're going to talk about that a little more tonight. This is where I am now. Number two, most people are under the misconception that God uses only the really gifted, extraordinarily talented people. This is a misconception. It's not borne out in the scripture, is it? God chose the most unlikely disciples to be his 12 disciples. He wasn't looking. Look what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 12 and 9. He said to me, my grace is sufficient for you my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For my strength, somebody say my strength, is made perfect in my weakness. Isn't that a paradox? That God's going to take the foolish things of the world and confound the wise. He's going to pick people who are not noble, wise, and he's going to turn the world upside down. So it is a misconception. God can use you. It's very possible that a person's greatest ministry will not come out of their giftings. It may come out of their pain. God doesn't send pain, but he can certainly use it. Who's better equipped to help someone struggling with alcoholism than someone who was an alcoholic that God rescued? You know what I'm saying? To be able to say, I've, I've been where you are. I know how you feel. I was there. This is what happened to me. This is what we're talking about tonight because it's a crucial, very important step for people who are struggling with hurts, hangups, and habits. It don't matter if you do AA if you do Celebrate Recovery or any of the programs, one of the, it's usually the last point, the strongest point, is the way you stay recovered is by helping other people. And this is important. Number three, the truth is that someone is fully recovering. The truth that someone is fully recovering is when they start focusing outside themselves and stop being absorbed with their particular needs, hurts, and problems. This is how you know, this is how you know that recovery's taking place. When you start reaching out to help us. We have a man in this church, I won't tell you who it is, but I don't think he'd care. I don't think his brother would care, who for years and years has battled drug addiction. And it was just a, it's just been a, a serious problem in his life for years and years. But he made a step a while back and got involved in a recovery program. And today, today, he was here a few weeks ago and I talked to him. Today he is one of the instructors at the center that brought him help. So now he's helping other people. And this is a part of his recovery process. The psalmist said in Psalm 19 and 71, it was it is good for me 
that I have been afflicted, that I may learn from your statutes. You know, pain talks, doesn't it? It, it? it can talk loud. I walked out in the hall the other day after church, and my son was on the floor on all fours, and he had one of his legs way back over here, and he was doing some kind of stretch. And Brandon Cox said, uh oh, looks like somebody's had a sciatic, what do you call it? A sciatic nerve problem. <laughs> Pain talks, don't it? Anybody ever been woke up by pain? It screams at you. It's no, it's no fun. So he said, it was good for me that I've been afflicted, that I may learn from your statutes because that pain caused you to look for help. Amen? This is where a man who has recovered from hurts, hangups, or habits, or whatever it may be, can be a blessing to somebody that's struggling when they say this, something like this. I can relate to that. I've been there. Has anybody here ever been there? I can relate to that. I understand. And that speaks volumes, doesn't it? That speaks volumes. Number four. I like this. God wants to use and recycle the pain in your life to help others. But you've got to be open and honest about it. One of these services, we're going to have a deliverance service, a breaking the chain service. And you, you remember we did a cardboard deal? Cardboard testimonies. You remember that? Here comes a young man up here. I don't know how old he was. If you were here, you remember. And he had a cardboard sign, and he walked up here, and he put the sign up, and it says, I was addicted to pornography. And he turns it over, and he says, the Lord set me free, something like that. And everybody was like, really? Well, his mother got up and ran around the church. So I supposed that she knew. So I asked her later, you didn't know that. Didn't have a clue. She was rejoicing. You know, that'd be the best way to find out if you're a parent, right? <laughs> After they're recovered. That'd be a reason to run around the church. Thank God I didn't know it while it was going on. I appreciated our speaker last week. He had his boy sitting over here. How old is he? 11, 10? A little older than he looks. He's going to be built like his daddy, I believe. And he's up here and he's talking about BC before Bible college. I think that's what he called that. And he's talking about how he was addicted to pornography. And if you're a parent like me, you're immediately thinking, man, I don't know. Is he going to say that in front of his boy over here? Well, his boy travels with him a lot, so I'm sure he's heard it before. And then when you understand what he's doing, you see, when you've been there and you've come back and you understand the hurt and you know how to recover, this is when you can help people. God wants to recycle your pain, the pain in your life to help others, but you've got to be open and honest about it. Peter said... In chapter 3, verse 15 of the first epistle, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. And always, somebody say always, be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Sanctify God in your hearts and be ready always to give. Has anybody here been delivered from something? Sure you have. All of us have. Amen. You know, when you have pain in your body, pain is telling you something is wrong. Something's not right. And I remember my wonderful ski trip many years ago when I broke my wrist on the first day and sat in the room the rest of the week while everybody else was having a blast. And I was... Closed the door and 
got in the dark and took pain pills till I got home, had surgery. I never forget what they told me. The pain comes from the swelling. <laughs> That's what's causing all the pain. It's swelled up like a grapefruit. And it, it, it works that way in our lives. Pain's telling you something. Pain's telling you something's not right. Pain's telling you you need to do something. You need to make a change. I have a friend that called me last week and we were talking. And he was telling me he's never sick. He rarely visits the doctor. And he wanted me to pray for him. And he said, uh, he explained what took him to the doctor. And it was kind of a frightening experience. He gets to the doctor and it was a cold day, and he had a sweater, and he took his blood pressure, and the nurse said, would you take your sweater off? So he took his sweater off. She took his blood pressure again. She's like, wow, we, let's take that again. She took it again, and his blood pressure was over 240. The top number, uh, the top number was over 240. The bottom number was, the top number was over 230. The bottom number was over 140. He didn't know he had a problem. She ran and got the doctor. We got something going on. That's pretty high, isn't it, Chris? Yes, sir. That's kind of like you better do something about it, right? Yes, sir. That's like not wait till tomorrow, next week. That's like, or you're going to die. You're going to have a stroke. You're going to be in a wheelchair. He said, I'm, I don't go to die. I said, you get a wellness visit every year? No, I'm never sick. Why would I get a wellness visit? Sounds like a man, don't it? Can I get a witness from the ladies? Who's, who's, who's better equipped now to tell somebody, man, if I was you, I'd go get a wellness visit. I'd, yeah, I'd, check that, I'd check things out every now and then. Let's make sure. Who's better equipped now? So he'll be talking to somebody down the road, and he'll be saying, you know what? You really ought to get a wellness visit every year. Now, I'm not trying to promote wellness visits. That's not what I'm up here for. I'm up here to make a point to you that someone who's been there has an advantage many times over somebody that hasn't. doesn't mean you can't help somebody that hadn't been there, that hadn't had the same hurt, the same hang-up, whether it be drugs, alcohol, or whatever it may be. It's not what it means at all. You're going to find out Sunday morning there's a lot of issues that's a whole lot are just as serious as some of the things that we typically think about. You're going to find out Sunday morning in first word. Amen. One thing we always tell people, you need to get healed before you try to help other people get healed. Be sure you're healed. Because spirits transfer. Good and bad. Well, somebody that's not healed themselves, and we've seen it over and over again. My wife's seen it more than I. They immediately want to get healed, get healed, get healed. You recover. And that's, that's what seven is all about. We're going to help you get recovered. And then the way you're going to stay that way is you're going to minister to other people. You're going to help other people. Can I get a witness from somebody? Yeah. Number five, the moment each of us is born again, we become a missionary. And a part of God's plan of reaching out to hurting, lost people. I know that Living Bible is a very loosely paraphrase. It's not really a translation, but sometimes I use it and look at it because it just kind of brings some things out. And this verse in Acts 20 and 24 says, this is uh, Paul speaking. He said, but life is worth nothing unless I use it for doing the work assigned me by the Lord Jesus. The work of telling others the good news about God's mighty kindness and love. Can I, can I share that with you again? But life is worth nothing unless I use it for the work assigned me by the Lord Jesus. We're not born again to be just sitting on a pew and waiting on a rapture, are we? We're to be disciples. Go, our disciple makers, go make disciples. Go to every nation. You remember that sermon that came back to my mind today? Who wants to be like Jesus? You remember that? If nobody raises their hand, I'm preaching it again. Because it was a good one. I don't have many of those. That was, that was great. Hey, Jesus was a friend of sinners. Do you have any sinner friends? Do you know, are you friends? He didn't, didn't just say he knew them. He was a friend of sinners. 
God help the Pentecostals of Bossier be more involved in reaching sinners this year. The hope for our nation is a great awakening. You'll read about it in the prayer book, the book on prayer. That's the only hope for our nation. A nation that forgets God, the psalmist said, shall be turned into hell. That word hell is the word Hades. It means the grave. Righteousness exalts a nation. Sin is a reproach to any people, any people. It's a reproach. It's a reproach. And America needs an awakening. There was a day in our lives, all of us, when just the word, uh, what can I say here? Just, uh, ooh, I don't know what to say. You wouldn't even have used the word hell in the media. And today, they use every nasty, ungodly, all kinds of profanity. And I couldn't even say golly. That's like, get to the bedroom. My dad said golly was short for, what, what did yours tell you? Jesus. He said, that's short for Jesus. You can't say that. Every kid in my school said, oh, golly. See, some of you are really cringing because I'm saying it up here tonight. You're like, who don't do that in the pulpit? Everybody say amen. amen. We got a work to do, Bozier. I want my last years to be my best years in reaching sinners. And we don't want to just soothe our conscience by sending hundreds of thousand dollars to help them overseas. We want to impact our city. Let's be a city on a hill right here. That first thing we read, you heard it by my words and by my example. We can make a difference. Somebody say amen. amen. Number six, ways to tell your story. We'll hasten now to an ending. Ways to tell your story. Number one, be humble. We're all in the same boat. We're all fellow strugglers, all of us. Paul said it, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The most religious people in Jesus' day were the ones he criticized the most and condemned the most, right? We don't have it all together, ladies and gentlemen. Every human hurts somewhere. Write that in your notes. Every human work hurts somewhere. Many humans strive through their work, through drugs, through alcohol, through illicit sex, sometimes even through anger, to ease that hurt. So we gotta be humble. It was like Brother Brown confessing his sin up here the other night. We, we could all wear a t-shirt to said, I've been there and I've done that. Number two, be real. You can help other people by being honest about your own hurts. My wife and I are scheduled to do a marriage retreat here in a couple of weeks for a great church. And we always start out a marriage retreat by telling them what we went through as a husband and a wife. And I was a pastor, a preacher. And we tell them that. You think, oh, you, you know, do, do. I don't see any halos out here. Now, when I actually, with the lights in my eyes, I kind of see some halos, but I know they're not real. They're fake. Anybody around you got a halo? What you are at home is what you really are. Aren't you glad we all don't know what you are at home? Testing, am I on? Amen. Whoo. Jesus. Be humble. Be real. Transparency is not bad. I've been there. I've done that. I know, how you're, I know what you're talking about. I know what it means to hit bottom. Number three, don't lecture. Boy, this is important. God wants you to be a witness, not a defense attorney. I want to remind everyone of something tonight. You have the keys to the kingdom. You don't have the keys to hell. Man was wanting me to reach out to his son the other day through a text. He's not one of you, so don't worry about it. He's just a guy between the North and South Pole. And he was wanting me to text his son and tell him. And he said, I've already told him he's going straight to hell. Well, you know, that's probably not going to work. 
<laughs> Don't ever tell anybody to go to hell either. Never. I don't care how mad you are at your husband. <laughs> what you are at home is what you really are. I am on, right? Don't lecture. Use the Bible. You know what I read today? 10%, right at 10% of everything Jesus said was either a quote or he was alluding to a passage of scripture from the Hebrew Bible, from the Old Testament. 10%. This is the way you witness is use the Bible. Use your testimony. That's what we're talking about tonight. You can be healed. You can be free. Don't lecture. Number seven, always consider your beneficiaries by asking yourself, who could benefit the most from hearing your story? Before we go, I have a couple of verses I want to read to you. This was just something I ran across today that I felt like fit right here. The first one is in Mark chapter 1, verse 40 through 42. And they don't have this on the keynote. Maybe they can look it up in the New King James Version. It's Mark 1, 40 through 42. If they can get that up, I'll give them just a second because this is what we're talking about tonight is helping others. And this is the way we become who God wants us to be. And we utilize our strengths. And you say, well, God's not going to use me. I don't have that talent. Everybody has a story. And everybody can use that story. Would you say amen? amen. All right. There it is. Nope, that ain't it. They're, they're trying to get it. Now listen to this. If you want to just listen to me, listen closely, please. All right? This is in the first chapter of Mark. Mark doesn't. Mark is a helicopter. The book of Mark goes whoo, straight up. You know, Matthew starts with the genealogies and you got to read through all the begats, right? And then Luke has the story of the birth of Jesus. Mark, he just went straight up. He wrote to the Romans. The Romans respected power and authority. So in the very first chapter, it says, now a leper came to him, imploring him, kneeling down to him and saying to him, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus moved with compassion. Somebody say compassion. Let's read that again. Jesus, we believe he's God in the flesh, right? He don't change, right? He's the same yesterday, today, and forever, right? So he wouldn't be any different today. That's what I'm getting at. We saw the leper move with compassion, stretched out his hand, and touched him. You and I know that Jesus used several different methods of healing people. He did not have to touch the unclean leper. Didn't have to. He knew when he reached out and touched the unclean leper that he was breaking Jewish law. By the way, the law he wrote. That's something to consider, isn't it? But he reached out and touched him and said to him, I am willing to be cleansed. And as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. The word compassion comes from a Latin word which means to suffer with. You can have concern without having compassion. I would suggest that concern engages our mind feel bad about somebody, you feel bad about this, you're concerned about it, but compassion engages our emotions. That's compassion. I read a story about a pastor years ago who was rushing home on Wednesday to change his clothes and come back to church and he saw the lights flashing, pulled off the road, felt urged to do it, and he was saying in his mind, I gotta get home because I gotta get back to church. And he said, the scene horrified him. He 
he saw a little crumpled bicycle and a little boy. The ambulance was there, was not there yet, but some policemen was there. And the little boy was crying. Part of the handlebar was embedded in his head. And the little boy was crying. And he was saying, I want my daddy. Blood was running out of his eyes. He couldn't see. I just freaked my wife out. The pastor said, he said to the policeman, he said, I don't know why I said it. He said, I'm a man of God. Can I go to him? And he said, yes. He said, when I leaned over the little boy, he couldn't see me good. He said, are you my daddy? And he said, yes, I'm your daddy. And he said, when I did, the boy quit crying. Parents arrived after a while. He went with them to the hospital. He said, I was there with him when the doctor came out and said, everything's great. Surgery's great. Your boy's going to be fine. That's compassion. Your emotions are involved. I can't drive past this accident. You see, when your emotions are involved, you want to help. Now, Jesus was moved with compassion. It's quite a story, isn't it? Right off the bat, a leper comes and said, if, thou, if you're willing, you can. Nothing happened until God spoke. He wasn't healed when God touched him. He was healed when he spoke. When he spoke, it's very right there in the Bible. I read it to you. And when he had spoken, immediately the man was healed. Now, would it be great? And we know this can happen, Brother Barry. People can be delivered immediately. You and I, us, as a body of believers, we want to have compassion. Not just concern. We want to have compassion. Compassion means you're willing to reach out and touch somebody. That's what compassion means. It means you may get your hands dirty. That means you may be <laughs> wading into some areas that are unclean. Right? By unclean, I'm not just talking about dirty dirt. I'm talking about sin. I'm not going to make you get involved in sin, but you're rubbing shoulders with sinners. You're going to be a friend to sinners. Compassion. Somebody say compassion. It's when your emotions, your emotions. It means to suffer with. That was the original meaning of the word. Compassion allowed Jesus to feel the leper's pain. It allowed Jesus to feel his fear. It allowed him to feel his hopelessness. And certainly he had it. I have one more verse and we'll go. Luke 10, 33 and 34. This is the parable of what we call the parable of the Good Samaritan. This jumped out at me today. But a certain Samaritan, Luke 10 and 33, a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, where who was? The man that's in the ditch. It's been beaten and robbed and left to die. Came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion. Say that word again. So, he went to him. He bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And he put him, on, he put him in his car. And brought him to church. <laughs> I made that up. And notice these last four words. And took care. That's five, isn't it? And took care of him. He took care of him. He took care of him. Say that with me. He took care of him. Say it again. What led him to do this? The priest walked by. The Levite walked by. They didn't touch him. It was an untouchable situation. Maybe they thought it was hopeless. Maybe they left him for dead. He's going to die anyway. I'm not going to mess with him. But a Samaritan, he came by, had compassion. His emotions got involved. You know, if you're in that scenario, you've got to be thinking, I wonder where the thieves are. This man obviously had money. 
he obviously had oil, he had wine, he had means to take care of the man. He had a beast, we know that. So you got to be looking around thinking, wow, I wonder, wonder where these are. But his compassion drove him past the danger to say, I cannot sit idly by. I have to get involved. This is a great vision for the Pentecostals of Bossier City. To be moved with compassion. You never know who's walking to this altar. You never know who's coming up to the front. You never know who's asking for prayer. But as a body of believers, let's always remember every human hurts somewhere. And boy, we've been shocked sometimes to find out later who was praying in our altar and how desperately they needed help. And thank God, I'm going to preach about this soon. We want to have the kind of church where somebody can. Remember when Paul reached in to the fire, put down a stick and a serpent bit him? Remember that? What did he do with it? Shook it off where? In a fire. This is the church we want to be. Where somebody can shake their devils off in the fire. Right here in the front of this church. Just get rid of them. Right here. And we want to be moved with compassion. Stand with me. So it's very easy to get lost in our own world, our own hurts, our own pains, our own failure, our own successes, our own blessing. It's easy. It's easy, right? It is easy for all of us. So this is the last lesson on this journey to happiness. The greatest thrill in the life of a church is to have babies, just like in a home, to have new converts. How long have you been here, Barry? Six years. They gave him a little while to live. Right after he got in church, he has his checkup tomorrow. Every time he goes, he gets a clean bill out. We thank God for that. That was over four years ago. Shake it off in the fire. We want this church. And I, I will tell you this, and we're gone. That is one reason I was so desperate to get back to what God called us to be. A church on fire with an altar service Amen. that changes lives Amen. and our lives. And we're going to do it Sunday in the name of the Lord. Amen. Father, here's our prayer at the Pentecostal Symposium. Oh, God. It's a sick world we're living in, Lord. But I want us to be a church known to have compassion, to be willing to reach out and touch the leper, the sinner, and speak the words of healing, to get involved in their lives, to share our testimonies, to let others know this is where we were with transparency, to be able to say, here's what God did for me. I know it. That's what we want, God. Help us to be a church of compassion. Not just for the down and out, for those who think they have it all together. And then life throws them a curve. We want to have compassion. And everybody said amen to that. I like to give God a little praise before we leave. Would you do that right now? Give him a little praise. Hallelujah. Bless the name of the Lord. Amen. 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 Put on your garment of praise when you come to worship Sunday morning, all right? So we won't have any singing in first word, no worship. We're going right into the lesson.